Um, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, as Matthias said, I'm going to talk a bit about Mixture of Experts today. Um, so Mixture of Experts are not exactly a new idea, uh, but they are getting much more popular, uh, much more popular recently, right? So if you look at the uh, Gemini, Gemini 1.5 report, you can see it's a mixture of experts. Uh, GPT-4 allegedly is also a mix, mixture of ex experts, even though it's not uh, officially confirmed. Uh, Grok-1 is a mixture of experts. You have lots of uh, open, large open source models that are MOEs, like uh, DeepSeek MOE2 and uh, Quen2. And, and obviously, there is ours, uh, the Mistral AI uh, mixture of experts, called Mixtral, um, that I personally had some involvement um, uh, working on. And it's, we released it last year. Um, we released another one in the beginning of this year. And it was quite, like, we ha had a really good reception. It's still one of the most liked models in Hugging Face. So we're quite happy with the, with the, the splash that it generated. Uh, so it, it does show that there, there is a lot of offer and demand for uh, MOEs, right? Uh, and the reason I think that they are be becoming more popular now is that uh, models as you might have noticed are getting bigger, and with that they're also getting better, but bigger models tend to be slower, uh, everything else being equal. And, but the MOEs allow you to, um, they, they are sparsity and, or com conditional computation technique that allows you to decouple the speed and model capacity to some extent. And by model capacity, I, I, I don't want to get very theoretical, so I just want to, just if I say capacity, just think it's a uh, quality increase by increasing the number of total parameters. So uh, this is uh, th this is probably the reason why people are investing so much on them. Um, so in, in this talk, I'm gonna talk a bit about what um, I'm gonna I, I want to teach you what are MOEs in the first place, uh, and then help you ask. Uh, answer whether you should consider MOEs for the kind of problem you wanna wanna solve, and then if we have some time, I can uh, hover over the design space of MOEs a, a little bit, and just to say some ideas that are have been floating around. But yeah, focusing especially on these two first questions. So what what are MOEs? Um, we can start with the classic mixture of expert a, a, a approach, which is which has been around. I, I said initially I said since the 90s, but then I looked at the uh, at the seminal paper and apparently it was presented uh, it was presented in the connection summer in the 80, in 88. So it's uh, it's from the 80s. So it's a it's a pretty classic technique. Um, and the way it works is fairly simple. I think most people might have might be familiar with it already. Uh, it has these it's, it's basically these three components, right? So first you you have a bunch of models and you're gonna feed the input to all these models, but you also feed the input to a gating um, model. And the, the gating model is gonna output some weights, and the ensemble's output is basically the weighted sum of the output of all the models using these weights from the gating model. Um, and then, if so this works by itself as an ensemble, uh, ju just doing that, but if you, uh, if you make sure that the, the, this, this gating vector is sparse, that is, the, it has many zero, zero values. Um, you don't need to compute the models that have zero values. Uh, so so you, you end up saving computation, right? So you just need to run the forward pass of models that are non-zero valued. Um, and then, for example, if you want to partition, if you want to uh, run this in a distributed system, you can, for example, put each model in a separate GPU. And then the, the gating unit is basically acting as a router. So it's, it's going to select which GPUs are going to be used for processing a certain model. And you can, with that, you can do some kind of domain specialization or uh, some, something like that, right? So you can, um, based on the input's content, you can pick the model that you want to run. So this works well, has, has worked well since then, and is still working well, especially for things like multitask learning. Um, but we're not going to talk about this in specific here because the models that I just presented uh, are not are not using classic MOEs um, because what they are actually using is this the mixture of experts layer, and that's the the main focus of the presentation. And yeah, the sparse mixture of experts layer. Uh, so this this was presented in this paper, this outrageously large neural networks um, paper, and it's a really nice paper. I highly recommend. Um, it's, uh, it's really cool, it has lots of cool things, like it has a really nice title, uh, uh, super uh, strong authors, has like scaling laws and large models before they were cool, 
it's from seven years ago, so it's very quite visionary. Um, so it's really cool. And yeah, so the mixture of experts layer is uh, operates on the, the same principle. So, but the, the idea is that you do it per layer, right? So for every layer, you're going to have a, a gating network. Uh, and I'm going to say gating network and router interchangeably here just because, uh, yeah, they are a bit. Um, so each router is, uh, is going to output a, a sparse vector. And the, the inputs are going to be processed by a small set of subnetworks that are informed by this sparse vector. The, all, every subnetwork is going to be called an expert. And the outputs of the subnetworks are combined with the gates to generate the outputs of the layer. And the, the cool thing is that everything is trained end to end. And since the assignments are per layer, you have some, um, so you have more expressivity, right? Because every layer is doing, uh, depend, is doing, is picking its experts based on the freshest uh, information, which is the, the current activations. Uh, so in, you can see, so this is a diagram of the, right, can, you can't see this, right? So this is a diagram of, of how it would look like. And this is basically the equation for, for the layer. It's, you have this G, which is the gating network, and EI, which is the expert. So I is just an index for, for that selects the expert. So, um, and yeah, for G, what they propose is this noisy top K gating, which is this big as, um, a function that is not, yeah, it's, it, it has three components, right? It, it has this, the softmax, which is fairly straightforward, but it has this, keep top k function in this h function. And um, so the keep top, top k is basically going to uh, impute minus infinity to the, all the values except the k largest. And minus infinity is just because you're going to go through the softmax. So the idea is to zero out the, the values of the, the non-k uh, non largest. Right? So you're going to just pick k, the k largest. And you have this other component that is basically Gaussian noise, but with a, um, the, the variance is going to be defined by a, a linear layer as well. Um, and this is kind of, a, kind of an exploration strategy. It's a way of uh, allowing the network to pick different experts and see how, it, how they look like. Um, it, nowadays, it's very common to just uh, omit this term completely and just use, for H, you just use a linear layer. So you're going to have linear layer, keep top K, and softmax. Um, and that, that works quite well. And then the, the idea is that since you're training end-to-end -end, end, the, and the gradients are flowing uh, through this, um, through the, the, the gating layer, you, you, the, the router is going to learn alongside with the network. Um, so it, it's worth spending some time to think uh, right now, how, how does this look like in the, with, especially with, in terms of like shapes and arrays. Um, so for, if you have E numbers of, of experts running on top K and you have a batch size of B, the, the batch is going to be split to, uh, into E, so each expert is going to see a subset of the batch. And uh, the layer is going to process um, K times B elements. So if you assume that routing is uniform, which is not, but like, like this, this can be used for considering the average case, uh, you're going to have K times B divided by E elements per expert. Um, and the parameter count of the layer is going to grow with E. So as you increase E, the number of, of elements that each expert is going to see is going to shrink, and the number of parameters is going to grow. Um, and one problem here that you can already think is that this is going to take a lot of memory. So putting E experts uh, and the best size of K times B in the GPU starts becoming, uh, it starts becoming expensive. Uh, so one way you can address this, it's not the only way, but it's one, one way that is proposed in the paper and uh, widely used, is with expert parallelism. Um, so this is a bit similar to other parallelism techniques that are more well known, but um, it has some specific, some particularities to it. So the idea is that you just put different experts into, into di different GPUs, and then you just send the inputs uh, to the GPU that, where the expert lives. Um, so yeah, in, you can see in the diagram here, like in, in this case, we have two GPUs and then two different types, two different inputs, and they're just being routed uh, through the GPUs and then routed back for the, for, to continue the, the computation. And this has a good synergy with data parallelism, which I, I, it's, a, it's a more of, it's a more familiar technique, right? Uh, so in data parallelism, you, you're basically splitting, you have a big batch, you split it across many GPUs, uh, and then you run 
and you copy the model over the GPUs and, uh, and you run the, each, each uh, slice of the batch set, uh, independently on the GPUs and then you aggregate the gradient. Um, so expert parallelism and data parallelism have a good synergy because if, if you have a mix of, of dense layers, dense are non-MOE layers, right? So if you have a mix of dense and MOE layers, you can run the dense layers in data parallel modes, and then when you hit a, an MOE layer, you, you switch to expert parallel mode, so you send the tokens to the right place, and then you send the tokens back to where they were and run the, the layer uh, as normal. So this, this works quite well. Um, but then you, you have a, a few other problems that emerge, partly because of expert parallelism and partly just because of the MOE. First, you have this problem of imbalance, and this is quite a big problem. Um, uh, this is actually the, the main problem, <laughs> but they, it, had, it leads to a few performance issues. But the problem of imbalancing is basically that since you can assign any input to any expert arbitrarily, you can easily assign um, the, all the inputs to one expert, for example, or for, to a few experts. So you're going to have a few problems with that. Uh, first, you're going to have problems with performance because uh, as you train the model or as you serve them as well. Um, so first, the, you're going to have stragglers, right? So if you're running experts in parallel, um, the expert and the experts have um, had different workloads. The expert with more load is gonna uh, finish last, and then you have a, you're gonna hit a synchronization point. Normally, as soon as you finish the expert, you're gonna wait, you need to wait for the other experts to to finish before you can uh, continue what you're doing. Uh, so the stragglers are gonna basically hold your your model uh, while the, the the expert with more load finishes. The other thing is um, memory blow up because allocating memory for these imbalanced workloads are quite, uh, are, uh, is quite a pain. So if you think of the worst case with expert parallelism, you can materialize the whole global batch in a single expert. So as I said, like with data parallelism, you, can, you split the whole batch across a bunch of GPUs, but it, you can in principle just send everything to one GPU which would just blow up the memory, especially on large, large workloads. Um, so, so I need you to, to be careful about that. And the other problem of imbalance, uh, as you train the model, is that the, um, if you don't pick the experts often enough, enough they're not going to be trained. Right? So the, the, when you don't select an expert, it, just, it doesn't get the gradients from that input. And if it doesn't get gradients, it doesn't train. It, it's, it's not going to improve. And then the best strategy is ju ju you should just ignore it because it's going to lag behind the other ones, uh, which may lead to a situation that some experts are just never picked. Um, and this is just a waste, a waste of, of memory, right? of space, because you have these parameters that are not being used for anything. Um, yeah, and then the way you can address the, these, imba these imbalance issues is with, I guess the, these are two workarounds. There are a few ways of addressing these imbalance issues, but these are the two main workarounds, which is with this um, auxiliary, with auxiliary losses, and with this thing that is the capped uh, expert capacity. So um, for auxiliary losses, I I'm gonna talk about both. For auxiliary losses, there are a few auxiliary losses that have been proposed. This one is not from the original paper. Um, I, I just picked one that I liked. Uh, it's, they, they also, there are lots of losses that are very, that have this formulation, but they are, slightly different in, the, in the, the specification of each term. So yeah, they, they vary a bit and it's worth experimenting with them a little bit. But the, the main idea of all of the auxiliary losses is basically to pen, penalize the router for producing imbalanced weights. And uh, also when you're building these auxiliary losses, like the assignments are actually discrete. So um, you, you, you actually want something that is at least, par at least partly differentiable because you want your you want to train the model end-to-end, -end, right? So, okay, so this is the one example of the auxiliary loss. I'm gonna expand these terms. Um, yeah, they are, they have, there are lots of terms, but the, the, the main idea is fairly simple. Uh, first, like some of, some constants here, the N is gonna be the number of experts, T is gonna be the batch size, and K of R is, is the number of experts processing each element. Um, so if you look at the term at the bottom, P of I, it's basically an average of SIT over T. Um, and SIT is basically the gate for, for the expert I at, uh, for token T. So you're basically gonna average the gate. It's gonna, so PFI is the mean gate 
for each expert. Um, and this part is differentiable. And the F, this Fi is basically the fraction of times that the expert I was selected in the top K uh, function. And this part is non-differentiable, but then you can just join, uh, put both together and it kind of works. And then alpha one is just an, a hyperparameter. The um, MOEs are not as, as are not very successful to are not very sensitive to this hyperparameter. Like many ranges, kind of work. So uh, just having the the auxiliary loss term here tends to be enough, uh, and some value for the hyperparameter. Um, and uh, yeah, so so this this covers the auxiliary loss. The other thing is the kept expert capacity, and this is uh, slightly the the term is fairly the concept is very simple but it has more consequences than the auxiliary loss, uh, surprisingly. And yeah, so the idea is that you define this, what we're calling expert capacity, which is basically the an upper limit of, of uh, number of elements that can be assigned to, uh, to a specific expert. And that's normally deter determined by, you, you get the B di divided by E, as I mentioned before, like this is proportional to the average case, and then you multiply it by a number, and this number is the, what we call the capacity factor. Uh, so a larger capacity factor means you're allocating more slack for, the, for, for imbalance. Um, and then, yeah, the, if the expert is assigned more elements the, the, than its capacity, it's going to ignore these elements. It just drops the token. And this tends to be recoverable because first, first if, you have, if your K, value of K is, is larger than one, so you're selecting more than one expert per token, you, can, you might be processing the, the uh, per element. Uh, you might be processing the element uh, in another expert, so it, it still gets some uh, processing. But also, in, you, we often use residual connections for, uh, for the uh, networks that we use nowadays. Uh, so for transformers have residual connections, also lots of uh, visual models, vision models have residual connections. And which means that even if you don't process the model, the token at that layer, you can still recover in the next layer. You just, you're not, if you, you're not dropping the token systematically, it's still not going to be, uh, like you're not gonna gen degenerate performance that much. Um, so here's an example of how expert capacity works, uh, like a, a diagram. And yeah, so here you, can, you have two cases, the capacity factor of one and capacity factor of, of 1.5. And so you have a batch size, uh, a batch of six elements, uh, three experts. So because the capacity factor is one, you have two, um, slots per expert, right? So here you assigned, the, in this case, uh, the expert one got three tokens, the three elements, and it didn't, since that capacity is true, it needs to drop one element, so it's dropping this blue one, right? Um, and then expert one has two elements, so it's fine, and expert three has uh, one element, so, it, so this white slot represents just capacity that was not used. Um, and then with capacity 1.5, uh, the, the capacity factor 1.5, the capacity is going to be three, which means that you have three slots, and the three slots are going to be enough to cover all the all the elements. But notice that now you have more uh, like uh, uh, space that was allocated but not used. So this increases the chance of overhead, and it's partly partly because uh, of because these tensor programming frameworks use fixed shapes. Uh, for processing everything, but partly also because of the stragglers problem that I was talking about. Like in this case, for example, uh, you're processing. It, it's not might not be easy to read here, but it, uh, we're actually processing processing each expert in a different GPU, and so the expert three on device two is going to be um, is it, uh, it's, it's going to have just one one element, and it's probably going to have to wait until the the, the first device. Um, finishes processing the expert one. So this is one way you can, add, you can have overhead. And uh, given the fact that you, you need to pre-allocate memory and you might have overhead, you normally, it's, you have some benefits of just keeping the capacity low. And normally dropping a certain number of tokens is fine, especially for training. Like if you drop up to 20% tokens uh, empirically, like it depends on, the, on other, other factors, but a good heuristic is that if you drop up to 20% tokens, it, uh, you, the model doesn't suffer that much. Um, okay, so this basically covers MOEs. This is the main, uh, the, the main sets of, of concepts that you need. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a bit about how, to, how they, uh, these, these concepts transfer to LLMs. 
Uh, so uh, the simple way of making a, um, a transformer LLM into an MOE is just is replace the feedforward layers for MOEs, MOE layers. Each uh, MOE layer is going to run a feedforward layer as an expert and use Lapinor serial loss in the training and you're done. It's, it's done. <laughs> uh, so it's very simple. And this is what we did, did in Mixtro. So we have, so this, for example, is Mixtro 8, 8 times 7B, which, so you, you basically start with, uh, with the configs of a 7B model. In this case, it's a decoder only uh, dense 7B model. And you replace all the feedforward layers by an MOE layer uh, with eight experts. And you route every token to two experts. And, uh, and that's it. Like the, this, this, makes the, this is the architecture for, for Mixtro 8, 8 times 7B. And you get, we, we got pretty good performance with that. Like uh, back then, Lama uh, 3 was not out. So um, we had the, like it was beating Lama 2, 70B in, in some benchmarks. It was beating GPT 3.5 in some benchmarks. So it was, uh, this, this re recipe alone is, is, is quite good for, for that. But um, one, one thing to note here is that it's not a 7B model, even though the name suggests, uh, because since we're routing to two experts, you, the, every input is actually seeing more like 14B tokens. It's not exactly 14B because, as I said, you're just making the MOE, the feedforward layers MOEs. So you're just multiplying these by eight. Um, but since most of the parameters are in the feedforward layers, it's, it's something close to 14B. It's like 12B, something like that. And yeah, here's, here's thir yeah, more like 13B. And yeah, I just put this graph here to show that this, you, you change the, this is the, the parameter count, right? So the correct way of, of um, comparing it is to increase the parameter count as you increase the number of experts that are used per input. And this is how it looks like, the routing decisions look like if you pick into it. This is basically like getting the same uh, bit of code and just looking at, every, at three layers, one in the beginning, middle, and end. Um, what are the routing assignments per, per token? So every, every caller here is a different expert. Um, and yeah, I think the first thing you notice is that it's hard to tell if, the, if there's any pattern. Uh, but it's, uh, you, you can see some things, right? So, you can, so sometimes the, the, the routing assignments are kind of consistent across like number of like spaces, for example, or some synthetic elements. And sometimes they are not. Uh, for here, for example, it's just not. It's, it's routing uh, space for, for two different experts. And then if you look very close, closely into it, you, you start seeing some, some things that might be there. So it, there, is, there is some uh, system here, but it's, it's definitely not something that is very obvious. And the same thing for domains. So if we evaluated the mixture in the, in the, the different domains in the PIO data set, and it's, you can see some pattern like in the final layer for math, mathematics, for example, you can you, some experts are picked more often than, than others, but it's not something that flies in your face. Um, this, this varies a bit on architecture and how you train the model and everything. But just saying that it's not, I think lots of people look at MOEs and think, ah, it's going to decompose the uh, input space into meaningful chunks and stuff like that. And it's not necessarily true. Uh, but still, even if you don't have this, this very easy interpretability thing, you, can, you still get a big performance boost which speaks to the fact that it's uh, a really good sparsity technique. Um, I, I also, I've been talking about Mixtro, but I'm, I'd also like to mention Gshard, which is the first, uh, first MOE architecture applied to transformers. And I'm mentioning it partly because it's very similar to, to uh, what I just told, but it has a few differences. First, I've been saying, uh, talking about decoder only uh, MOEs, but the, this one, in, in, in fact, is an encoder decoder. And they do a few things different, uh, differently. Like first, they, they instead of replacing every feed, feed forward layer, they replace every two feed forward layers. And you can motivate this with, like, I think it's not, it's not obvious what's the best strategy. Uh, we opted for replacing every layer because it's, it's a bit more, uh, it's simpler. And so it's, it's easier to reason with and optimize for. But if you replace every, every two feed forward layers, you can, uh, you can argue that you don't need like you, you end up having a bet, better trade-offs, right? And you can also try to do something like just put the MOE layers in the end or in the beginning. So there are variations of that. Um, also, the top two routing strategy that it uses is not 
is a bit more complicated than what I uh, what I talked about. And it, in particular, it's routing. So it's it's routing two tokens, but the second token uh, it uses a different strategy. I'm not going to get very much in detail, but it's just it's a it's an interesting idea that might be worth exploring. And the third point is that it has this local group, group dispatching idea, which is another way of limiting uh, imbalance, the imbalance worst case, which I, I thought it was worth mentioning, but not spending too much time right now. But if you're really considering looking at, at MOEs, it might be good to, to read, read on that. Um, and it's a nice paper to read just for the low level details. Like it talks a lot about performance and it, it presents something that is basically a precursor of the JAX partitioner. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's quite nice. Um, So one question you might be asking is, what about attention? Like, well, are we, we're replacing MOE, fit forward layers for MOE layers, but why don't you replace every layer for MOE layers? So one big drawback is that you, act, you need the full sequence in the same GPU if you're considering uh, expert parallelism. So it's harder to route things around uh, with, with attention. It's not, it, like, harder is very relative. Like, you can do it. Uh, it, it it depends on how you implement it, but it's a bit, it's just one, one point to, to consider. And, and there, there are proposals, right? So I just listed three here, but there are a few more in the literature. But Switch Transformer, which is, um, which, which is a successor to the g paper, does some, has some preliminary studies, but they say that it's good, but it's too unstable, so they didn't, didn't put more effort into it. Uh, there is also this mixture of attention uh, paper and the Switch Head paper that have different strategies for how you route. And the idea is that you, you need to decide whether you route every, the keys, the values, and the, and, the, uh, and the queries separately, right? And in some cases, you also tie the values and the keys to make it more performant. So yeah, there are some, there, there's some room for, for developing here. But uh, I think one caveat is that it, there is no large performance model that does it. So you can see. At least I don't know any more any model that has more than say tens of ten billion parameters that use uh, routed attention, S unless GPT or Gemini do it, but they don't talk about it. Uh, so so yeah, that so I think the best place to start is is in the feed forward layer. And I think there are also good intuitions for why you, the, it doesn't help that much on on attention, right? So attention might be more about mixing than and feed, the feed forward layer. Uh, I think there is this idea that it's Kind of a, it's a, a knowledge lookup. So MOEs like Michelle experts would kind of complement this knowledge lookup mechanism. Um, so yeah, one one thing that decoders introduce when you when you're using MOEs for for transformers is this leakage problem, and I think it's a fairly relevant problem. Um, it's mentioned in the literature, but I, I think it's worth highlighting it. Uh, so the, the idea is that, so like uh, stepping back a little bit, like for our next token prediction, we're going to process the whole sequence in the, in the batch, right? So the, the targets are going to be very close to the inputs, right? They are, they are the inputs in a, in a way. You just shift them, right? Um, so you normally, this normally works for transformers because for attention, you just use Cosomax. And for the feed forward and layer norm, layer, uh, uh, layers, you, it's position-wise, right? So you just process every token separately, so it uh, also works. But um, if we try to do anything that uses batch level statistics, uh, it's gonna, it, it might leak information if we're not ca careful. So we need to, be, um, we need to be, make sure that the routing strategy doesn't use batch level statistics. And the problem is that the cap, capped expert capacity uses batch level statistics. And I think it might be confusing that I'm saying batch level statistics a lot, but I can give you an example to just to explain it. Um, so here is uh, a phrase that is tokenized and we, we're gonna uh, assume that we're gonna process it for, for the LLMs. And let's say that we assigned it to two experts. So I think, yeah, I'm calling it red and blue. It's kind of blue, purple, and red, purple here. But uh, yeah, you, yeah, so we assign it to two experts, red and blue. Red gets five tokens, uh, blue has three tokens. And let's say that you have a capacity of four. So you need to drop a token for the red expert. Um, so let's say you, you drop the first token that the uh, red expert got. Like you drop, you're picking something at random and you randomly pick the first one. Uh, 
Um, so imagine you're processing the token sequentially from left to right. When you get to the second token, to cha, they, uh, you, you know, if you, when you see that it's dropped, and you can see it, like if you're, if you're a transformer, <laughs> you, you can see it that, it that it was dropped because you're gonna get a, the zero vector in the activations. Um, you know that the, in the future there are gonna be tokens assigned to the red, ex, uh, to the red expert. So you know something about the content of the sequence and you can use this information to cheat, uh, which breaks causality, right? So if you drop the last token instead, you, it's fine because you're not, uh, you're, not you, you, you're doing things causally and you're still doing things causally if you drop the, any tokens from the last to the, from the end to the beginning. So you need to be careful about that when you're dropping tokens. And uh, I should say that you, most routing strategies are not completely causal and they, they break causality at some point. But if you draw, break it slightly, it tends to be okay. Uh, but I'm gonna talk a bit about that uh, soon. Uh, but yeah, so at least these are the, the main concepts for LLMs and transformers uh, for MOEs. And I should say that, as I alluded already, every component here some, has some cool alternatives, but if you do this, which is very close to the original uh, formulation, you're basically SOTA. Um, so, and most of the large LLMs that you see uh, stick to this re recipe. Of course, they have some, some things that they do on their own, but they tend to be very close to this, this, this core. And the reason, I, I don't think it's clear, exactly clear the reason, but I think in my experience, lots of modifications that are proposed end up not, being, not yielding a good trade-off. So it's good to, con to think about the trade-offs when, um, when you're proposing the modifications. And also another thing is that the modifications don't, uh, often don't scale well. So they might work for like 200 million parameter models, but then when you go to 10 billion, they just stop working. Uh, one example uh, that from something I just talked about is the leakage. So if you have a modification that, that, that increases leakage, you may, the model may use the, the leakage better as it uh, gets larger. So you're gonna start seeing a divergence between the training and, and validation loss, for example, uh, and, the, and the validation loss uh, gets less and less, like the gap between MOEs and dense models gets smaller and smaller as you increase the scale. Um, one aside here, like I talked about LLMs, but I should only say that vision transformers also have MOE formulations and they, are, they have some really cool work behind it. Uh, some, some ideas are a bit more applicable to, to uh, VITs. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I'm focusing more on LLMs for simplicity. So now let's talk about why we should use uh, MOEs, like, or I guess like, yeah, maybe breaking down the, the question into two, right? So if, you, if you, you're given a bunch of GPUs, should you train an MOE? And if, you're, uh, if, if you have a trained MOE, should you uh, take it over a dense model? And the second question is basically like, so for example, if you're looking at the hugging face or to see if you're gonna pick a model or if you're just like considering uh, your, planning like, okay, so that, what's the next model that we wanna train? Um, so actually I'm gonna answer the second question first because it helps inform the first question after. So let's just recall that the main goal here is to decouple processing speed from parameter count, and, and which I called model capacity. And the, the, the way we can do it is, is decoupling more let's say conceptually, is by decoupling the, by, by separating the way you, you count parameters into two ways. For, so first you have the total parameter count and you have the active parameter count. So the total parameter count is basically the sum of the all parameters in your model and it's gonna be proportional to the memory cost of the model. And the active parameter count um, is the, the, yeah, the number of parameters used to process a single element. And so I, I said in the mixed drop models, uh, what I said was, was about the active parameter count, right? The, the one that was closer to 14B. And this is gonna be more proportional to the cost of the, the computational co cost of the models, but I'm gonna talk a bit about that. So the active parameter count increases with, so both parameter counts are gonna increase with the number of layers and the model width. 
uh, if you use that recipe that I, that, that I was talking about with LNMs of just substitu substituting the fit forward layer. <coughs> but the active parameter count is gonna also increase with K in the top K. So the more ex experts you use, uh, the, uh, you route each token to, the, the larger is gonna be the active parameter count. While the total parameter count is gonna increase with the number of experts, the, just the sole number of experts. So this means that you can arbitrarily increase the total parameter count and keep everything else fixed, including the active parameter count. So you can increase the, the and the, so if you can increase the quality by increasing the total a, a parameter count, you can arbitrarily, like you can increase quality while keeping the speed uh, bounded. And yeah, the, the relationship between speed and, and active parameter count is not immediately straightforward, but it's, uh, but yeah, it is true that the amount of computation you're going to need per token is going to be proportional to the act active parameter count because it's very similar to standard transformers. But it's not going to be exactly the same speed as, as a dense model, right? So if you have a dense model that has 12 billion parameters and an MOE that have 12 billion parameters, the MOE is, is probably going to be a bit slower. And the reason is because you have a few more operations that are not exactly uh, matrix multiplications, but like copies and sorts and communications. So you do have some overhead. And this depends a lot on the implementation of the MOE, but the uh, heuristic is that it takes more or less 20% more time uh, than, a, than a dense model. Don't stick too closely to this heuristic, but it's a, it's a good uh, first approximation. And also it's a good way of seeing if your implementation is too slow. <laughs> um, and now, the, now talking a, a bit about the total parameter count and memory, and also later at speed, to a first approximation, the memory, memory is just a hard constraint, right? So if you, if you fit uh, the, the, if you manage to fit the model, you're good in the GPUs. So yeah, but, the, but in reality, you end up having, um, like if you, as you increase the total parameter count, you have some, it influences some factors that have to do with memory. First, it's gonna lower the maximum batch size you can fit in a set of GPUs. And it also lowers the arith arithmetic intensity of the model. If you, and this is lowered if you, uh, if you increase the total parameter count as it, and keep the active parameter count fixed. And the arithmetic intensity is basically the, the amount of computation that you do for, uh, uh, for every parameter you load. And these two things increase the chance you're, you're gonna be memory bound. Uh, so just, just in case you don't know what being memory bound is, um, I'm going to do a quick, uh, quick summary of it. It's basically whenever you're processing data on GPUs, you need to load the data and then process it, right? And you're memory bound if the time you're taking, you, you take for loading the, the data is larger than the time you, you take for, for processing the data. Um, so I, if, you, if, you're more, if you're interested in this, this link is quite nice for, for an explanation of how these things work on GPUs. Um, but yeah, so if you're memory bound, you're not using the, the processors uh, that well, and th that's what you paid money for, right? So uh, you can, yeah, so you, you don't, normally don't wanna be memory bound. And you can avoid that by processing more elements at the time, so you basically increase the batch size you process in a, in a GPU. But note that you can process less elements now because you increase the total parameter count. So you need to, so it's, it's kind of a fine balance. And also for decoding, this is even worse because you need to consider the, the KV cache. Uh, and the KV cache is just more memory to load uh, because you're not gonna uh, spend that much pro uh, time processing it. And so to recap here, the, um, you can run a model with a large total parameter count and only pay the flop cost of, an active perm of, of its active parameter count. And if the model still fits the, the GPU, that's great but you're more likely to be memory bound, which is not great. So in order to avoid this, you need a, a certain batch size, and the, but the batch size threshold increases uh, inversely with the arithmetic intensity of the model, which is, as I said, proportional to this ratio of total parameter count divided by active parameter count. Uh, so this is, very, this is a bit abstract, but I have some practical takeaways for when you're considering a model for, for inference, for an MOE model for inference. First, you're gonna need a certain amount of load uh, on each machine to run MOEs efficiently. So you need to have lots of, if, um, so for example, if you have a service, you need to have a certain amount of requests uh, per second to, uh, for it to be worth it. 
Otherwise, your latency is going to be um, more to this low end. But the point is, it's not going to increase much as you increase the number of, of requests until you get to this point that you are memory bound, no, uh, compute bound. Um, and yeah, it's easier to, to reap ben the benefits of MOEs if you're doing batch processing or also pre-fill. So basically, when you're processing a prompt, uh, MOEs are, tend to be more, it's easier to, to reap the benefits of, of it. Uh, and there are some tricks in the literature for inference that you basically increase the amount of, of data that you process per step uh, in order to do less steps. And these, these tricks tend to be really useful for MOEs. Uh, so one example is speculative decoding, and they, these tricks tend to be useful for MOEs just, just because of these things. Obviously, so speculative decoding introduces other issues, so you need to, uh, yeah, you need to consider everything together. Right? So coming back to the question, like given a trained MOE, should you use it over a dense model? If, if, so basically, if, you, if the dense model has the same quality as the MOE in, for the same size, the dense model is better. So just use the dense model because it's simpler, it's slightly faster, and it's going to be mem more memory friendly. But it happens that uh, good MOEs tend to have a, a better quality for its active parameter count. And then you need to know if you can run it efficiently. And it normally requires a good inference stack and a certain amount of load. So normally run it on a centralized service. But there are some cases that you just, for example, if you want to batch process a massive data set, uh, MOEs are, are a good option. And note that this applies to MOEs specified here, but there are some tricks that you can use to make it better for certain use cases. But th I think this is a good place to start. And yeah, so I can get back to the first question, which is, should you train an MOE? Um, then, so assuming that you want an MOE, right? So you can serve an MOE efficiently and everything. So it, it's probably it's probably a, a yes here because MOEs tend to perform better given a training budget. So you can you have some evidence in the literature for that. Um, here you can see some benchmarks. So for example, in Big Bench, uh, in this is Trivic QA. So these are uh, yeah model benchmarks. It's also there is also some evidence that MOEs are better for, are particularly good for uh, density modeling because they are they tend to produce more uh, well calibrated scores. So yeah, they, they do have some nice properties. Also, you can if you increase the number of experts, so increase and by that you increase the total parameter count. You uh, you you can increase quality, right? So increasing the number of experts is a valid scaling strategy up to a certain point. Obviously, you don't want to have so in the, in the literature, you're going to see lots of MOEs with like a thousand experts. But it's not, you probably don't want that because of the memory boundness thing that I, that, that I talked about. But you, and also you get uh, somewhat like diminishing returns as you keep in, increasing the models uh, the, by increasing expert parameter count. So you need to, to be a bit careful here. But there is the, this, and also if you use a very small number of experts, you don't get that much benefit from if you look at these curves. So you have this golden region between, let's say, like eight and sixty-four experts. That is a good. It tends to be a good number for uh, if, if you want to just increase quality and keep the active parameter count fixed. And yeah, most of the large models that we see uh, have this number of experts, or they use another strategy, which is this uh, that I'm can I'm talking I'm going to talk about, which is you can also squeeze out more performance by parameterizing things in a different way. So what I described until now was basically like you just get the, the fit for layer you're using and replicate it many times, and that's going to be your MOE layer. So every expert is going to be basically the same thing as running the fit for layer in the dense transformer. But if you use smaller fit for feed forward layers and more experts, um, the, the, you, you can actually get more quality for the same active and total parameter count. So this is has been proposed as uh, the granularity of the experts. So basically having a granularity of G uh, means that you have G times more experts, but the experts are G, G, G times smaller. Uh, so if you do that, the active and total parameter count stay fixed, but the quality is a bit better. So you can see in the literature, you can, no, in, in, the, open, in the open models that you uh, see available, sometimes you see like a large number of experts, the, but the experts are always smaller. So you have like 64 experts, but the experts are eight times smaller than, than, the, uh, than what you would get if you had the dense model. <clears throat> so, if you, so to answer the should you train an MOE, I think 
you can you can get a better models with the same training budget, but yeah, coming back to the first question, the the the, the other question is basically you don't know if it's going to be useful or not. It depends on your use case. So you need to answer this question first, but if, you, if the answer is yes, you can probably train an MOE with the same inference budget that's going to have a, a better quality. Um, so I think I'm going to pause here and, uh, and see if anyone has questions, because this, uh, the next part is basically hovering over some things that exist. Um, but I think if you know the contents that I presented so far, it's basically what you need if you, if you want to consider, uh, I don't know, uh, Consider if you want to dig, dig deeper into your MOEs. So, does anyone have any question? Um, thank you for the talk so far. Just one technical question. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on the details of how you get the differentiable auxiliary loss? Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's partly differentiable, right? So. Uh, yeah, so the P, P of i is differentiable, the f of i is not. <laughs> uh, but this, the f of i ends up being uh, weighting up the, the P of i, right? So it, this ends up being more useful. Because one thing you could do is you could just get P of i squared, uh, and it would be fully differentiable. But the f of i is uh, it's, it's still uh, end up, ends up being helpful. Uh, it, it takes into account what experts were selected, right? Because otherwise, you, you may have like, this, this uh, long tail of experts that were not, like, that are. Uh, Uniform, but it, we're not selected, so it doesn't matter. So, what exactly do you do then? Sorry. So, what exactly do you do then? No, you, you can you just plug it into the you sum it with the loss. Okay. It's, a, it's just, a, just a new uh, a new loss term, and then you just back propagate through it, and and it works. So you just ignore non differentiability. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can see that there are lots of things that are a bit patchy here, but they, can, uh, they, they end up working quite well. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I, it's my understanding that with the mixture of experts, like the initial motivation is the idea to divide the task to subtasks that we have experts for, and then this ensemble of experts would have a better overall solution. But it seems like the intuition I got that in practice, especially when you have like mixture of expert layers, Mm. is that basically we're just benefiting from the idea of having an ensemble of smaller learners than to actually have like something like uh, task-specific experts or task-specific learners. Is that true or no? Yeah, so I think it's... I mean, I would, because for example, with the distribution you showed about the task, uh, like uh, are similar tasks being assigned to same experts, for example, mm. it seems that basically no, like in general, so it seems that basically what we're benefiting from is just having an ensemble of models or like sub-models instead of having like one thing. Yeah, I think one, I, I prefer to think of it as a sparsity technique. So you can think of it as a big, uh, if you put all the, the expert matrices together, mm -hmm. it's basically a big sparse matrix. So you're basically just, you're, you're doing, you're training a sparse matrix in a way that works. Yeah. Um, because it's not exactly an ensemble in the sense that you don't, I think if you, if you were, in, in a in a similar, in, you generally this, the the training signal for each model is the target, right? So you would uh, you would train every model uh, with the with the target of the, of the inputs that they, they got, and in the mix of expert layers, you you're actually just training everything in to end. So it's not like exactly an ensemble in this sense, uh, but yeah, it depends on what, what you mean by ensemble. But I, I agree that it's not. I think you can't really interpret it as just decomposing the, the task into subtasks. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that was my question, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. One, one note here is that uh, uh, there are some, every MOE paper has normally like an interpretability part in the end, like that you're just trying to look at what, what is happening. And uh, I think th there's one called STMOE that they see that the, the, if you train encoder decoders, the encoders tend to specialize a bit more than the decoders. And they have some arguments for that. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, and the, the, there are, I think they're arguing that the, yeah, the, the way that they train decoders end up, ends up getting in the way. Um, but yeah, it's a, I think it's kind of an open question whether, like why, and I think some different papers get different uh, results from that. From, um, from, like some papers have more, they find more evidence of, 
uh, compositionality or modularity. And some papers, like in our case, for example, we found very little evidence. So I think there, the way you train it has a, a big effect. Um, but yeah, I think, I guess my main point is that it's not a necessary condition for, for the MOE to be performed, performant, right? Even if it doesn't specialize, it still, uh, it still gives you the benefits that you want. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I, while, while you talked, uh, I, I wondered, uh, could you use one single expert instead of a uh, different expert? We, which can act like different experts. So it should take a batch and a, uh, an additional vector that specifies uh, which ex expert is expected to act now. So it could be one hot vector. And uh, it should speed up the inference. And, uh, is it useful? So you get a batch, and then you select one expert for the whole batch. Is that it? Uh, you could say like act as one expert. You could also say like act as like, different experts for the same batch. Mm. Could it work? Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I need to understand it better, but it's it's probably. It, yeah, it's probably a good idea, and it's like, it's kind of a nice, uh, nice area of, of investigation. Basically, so one cool thing that I like about MOEs is that you it forces you to think of the whole system, and yeah, if you find something that works well for uh, that, it's basically an architecture intervention that works well for inference. It's probably like a really good thing to, to explore. Hi, uh, so I had a question regarding load balancing and um, the auxiliary loss that you consider for load balancing, doesn't this induce um, redundancy among the active experts? As, as you can see from the, from the graph that there's no domain specialization mm -hmm. among the experts. So I see this quite similar to uh, possibly a dense model, which may have a lot of redundancy also in the representations. And I link this to another sub question that is, since we parallelize experts and batches in multiple GPUs, wouldn't you still have multiple GPUs that are activated and thus the almost, I mean, not such an efficient energy consumption? All right, yeah, okay. So yeah, the, the, I, I guess I should, it's probably better if I, oh no, you, you, you said in the microphone, okay. Um, yeah, so the first question is about the load balancing. Yeah, I agree that it does, it does force the expert to be less specialized. Or it, at least in, in principle, it, it should force the experts to be spe less specialized. But if you remove it, you have these odd, uh, other problems. Especially uh, even if you if you have a setup that you that you don't need to cap the expert capacity. Uh, the, uh, if you use a, a good kernel and if you don't do lots of expert parallelism, you can you probably don't need that much capacity like uh, capacity capping. Uh, even though even then you probably need the uh, there is actually a paper, the, the paper called Megablocks that. They actually say that, I think, if I remember correctly. But basically, you need the auxiliary balance loss just because of the dead, dead, dead experts, right? So the, if you don't, um, so you, you're trading off forcing the, you, uh, you're adding a bit of redundancy, of redundancy on the experts to not having any expert uh, leg off and, and be dead. So you could come up with a different training technique that you remove that experts uh, at some point. But at least for this setup that we have, uh, it, you, you need it for, to have a final performance model. And for the second one, um, yeah, I think if you're routing one token, uh, you, yeah, the, I think the, the way you, you should see it is basically like you have this global batch and you're splitting the batch across the experts, right? Um, so, so you're always going to use all the GPUs, but they, they are going to be... Um, the, uh, it's gonna basically be a, a smaller batch. If you were doing just data parallelism, you, you, you uh, yeah, actually, if you were just doing data parallelism, you had, you, it would probably blow up memory because of the, of, the, uh, of, of putting the, mem the, the, the parameters, having to replicate the parameters everywhere. But you're not, um, yeah, so basically, uh, sorry, it's a bit, the answer is a bit confusing, but the, the way you could look at it is basically you're doing a more efficient way of data parallelism that uh, where the parameters are not replicated. So it's, uh, it's, in, it's more efficient in this, in this respect. I don't know if it's, this is clear. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I can spend just a few more words. Um, 
Yeah, sorry, no, I forgot the question, actually. I'll ask it later. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi, um, I'm wondering about interpretability of these experts. Like, do we actually see one expert becoming, one model becoming an expert on like medicine, one on math, one on movies or something like that? Like, is it like, could a human be the gate, like do the gating or, or is it more like abstract uh, expertise? Yeah, it's, it's similar to the, the question he asked. It's, uh, it's basically, uh, in our case, in the mixed row model, we didn't see any uh, big evidence of, of specialization. But depending on, the, on who you ask, it, uh, there is more or less evidence of specialization. So depending on how you train it and, um, and how you anal analyze it, you can see some experts that tend to be more related to one topic or one, one specialty. But for our case, it's, it's not that much. Uh, if you go with classic mixture of experts, you tend to find more special, specialization. So I think it, it might be part, partly because of the an artifact of the end-to-end -end tra training. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, in, in this case, it, uh, we, we didn't see that much. Um, thank you for your talk. I also have a similar question to previous ones. So uh, is there some research or some experiments maybe on like manually forcing experts to be like experts on, I don't know, summarization or on mathematics, something like that? Yeah, there is uh, one. Um, so short answer is yes. <laughs> but uh, I think this, yeah, I guess I need to talk a bit about it's, it's something I, I might talk, I would talk later, but I think it's, it's probably a good idea that if I just advance this. But one, one thing that you can do is um, test-based routing, which is, so if you know which task you're, you're, uh, you're, you're doing, you basically feed the task info to the router instead of the, of the token, because normally you just feed the activations that you're gonna process in the expert, but you can just uh, feed the, some, some task information, and that, that's going to make, make the routing decisions fixed for the whole task, which is good for performance reasons. But yeah, the, it's a bit less expressive, but it's, it's good for other reasons. But then it also means that you can specialize better. So what's going to happen is that every task is going to have a mixture, of, a mixture of its own. And that way you can share parameters uh, across tasks, so you have some good transfer learning. But you, uh, and, the, the, and this is going to make the experts specialize quite a bit. And it's less kind of like you can make it, you can be more manual, right? And just pick a, a different submodule. But this, this way is still a bit soft and, and still allows the, the experts to specialize well. Uh, there are other ways you can uh, uh, induce specialization to the model. And that, that I'm not going to talk that, that much about. But yeah, so for example, classic MOEs are, are a good way of, of specializing the model. So there is this thing called range train merge that. Uh, or, or the other, yeah. I guess we, we can talk offline like, and if, if you're interested in that, there, there are some references. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, you also mentioned that so far we only see this apply to smaller models, unwritten B parameters, at least in the open source community. What are, in your experience, the main reason, maybe practically, why you wouldn't use it, for example, for the 70 billion models that you train? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think it's a mixture of a bunch, uh, a bunch of factors. So first, there is this thing that some of the, the, the proposals are, don't scale that well. They tend to work only on a small scale, but then when you try to reproduce it, you see the results on small scale, but doesn't, it doesn't transfer. And it, uh, and then, so for example, if it leaks information, it's, it's a clear case that does, doesn't transfer, but there are, there are other things that just are not, uh, don't scale that well. Um, but even things that tend to scale, I think MOEs are a bit more fiddly than, than dense models, or at least like we've been training dense models for, uh, for more time, or like we think there, there has been more collective effort into training dense, dense models than MOEs. So we, it's fairly like well-charted territory, but MOEs are a bit more uncharted. 
So you, you want to be, uh, for, large, uh, for large scale training, you want to be a bit more conservative just because uh, if something goes wrong, you need to uh, find the root cause quickly and, and fix it and everything. So this makes people be, uh, stick more to the things that are proving, proving to be working. Um, yeah, I think these are probably the main two reasons. Uh, yeah, just another question to applications of MREs. So could they also be used for data with different levels of denseness? Um, like the data is not distributed uniformly and so, or has some different geometric and local structures that experts are used for different regions in the data to like use a concept of locality? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's quite, it's an interesting question. I, I, I you probably, you probably can do that. One, one thing that I, uh, that just came to my mind is for vision transformers, you have uh, this, uh, one strategy that worked quite, quite well for uh, vision transformer is, is this batch prioritized routing strategy that is very simple. You just, when you're dropping tokens, instead of dro dropping the last tokens, you drop the ones that have less, uh, the smaller value, smaller gate values. And at least for visions, you, for vision, you, you do retain, the tokens that you retain are the ones that uh, are, tend to be a bit more task relevant. Uh, so this is a sign that uh, the, the gating is doing something that, that helps quite a lot with, with the task. So you can probably dig more deeply there like, and, and find more. Um, so I don't know any, I don't know if, if on the top of my head, this is the closest thing that I can think of that I know, but there is definitely potential to, to improve there. Like the, you can probably find some tweaks on the MOE architecture that will allow you to, uh, to work with these varying levels of density and volumetric data and this kind of stuff. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I was wondering, so you were talking about granularity. So what are the techniques that people have used? I guess matrix factorization, reducing the width. It's very the, simple. Just the, you, you, instead of using, so I normally have the fit forward hidden dimension. You just divide it by G. <laughs> okay. uh, so other works have worked on uh, different versions or this is the only one that you have okay. seen? Sorry? Can so the only thing you have seen is reducing the width of the FU4 wire network. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah, so if you if you reduce if you reduce the width, but then you double if you have the width and double the number of activated experts, uh, since you're summing everything in the end, like the 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 final effect is, is very similar, right? Um, so if you do tensor parallelism, for example, uh, expert parallelism and tensor parallelism are very similar if you think about them, but uh, I don't know if, how familiar you are with tensor parallelism, but they're very similar, but you have this convex sum in the end for, uh, for experts. So, uh, so yeah, uh, increasing the granularity is very similar to just doing slar ten larger and larger tensor parallelism. Okay, uh, the, I guess uh, we're good with questions. Yeah, I can just, so when, when do I finish? Is it uh, 12? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. Yeah, so I can just hover over some other ideas in the design space of MOEs. And yeah, it's, it's gonna be a non-exhaustive exhaustive list that I, uh, that I put together and, and trying to be non-exotic as well. Like, there are some formulations that are more uh, like uh, ambitious in changing the architecture. But, but the main point is to just show that you can, there are lots of directions you can Push these these models. Um, so one of them, I think this one is quite important, is this shared experts idea, which is basically, and it's it came up in different incarnations in in uh, in the last years. But the idea is, is just that you you reserve some experts to run for every token instead of routing them. And so so when you're running the MOE layer, you it's effectively the same thing as you just instead of running just the MOE layer, you run the fit forward layer and, an, and, an, and the MOE layer, and you sum the results. Um, and the, also these shared experts are not gated, so this is, make, makes them similar. And 
this ends up being, if you, if you compare on the active parameter count on total parameter count, like if you match them, shared experts tend to be a bit better. And it's not entirely clear why this is the case, but one intuition is that this allows the experts to be a bit more specialized because you have some, some like chores to do in the, in the activation space that you can let, let the shared experts do. And then the, the experts focus only on the, on some, uh, some, the, the reasons why they were selected. I don't know, I, this, this is just an intuition. I, I don't think this was empirically investigated that much, but it does work. So it, it's, it's good to know that this exists. Uh, there's batch prioritized routing that I was talking about. You, you just drop um, tokens with smaller gates first. And this, I like to say this is because of the decoder leakage problem. You can't really use it on decoders that very efficiently. Some people use it, it kind of works, but then it's uh, use it at your own risk, especially with this anti-scaling thing, um, anti-scaling property. There is something more, a bit more exotic, which is expert choice routing. <clears throat> and the idea is that instead of, instead of looking at the token and picking the top K experts, you look at the expert and pick the top, K, top C tokens, right? C is the capacity. <coughs> so this means that uh, you never have empty slots in, the, in, in your capacity. Like all the tokens are processed, uh, like all the experts process the, a fixed amount of tokens which means that load balancing is not a, an issue that much. And it also allows you to do some adaptive computation because if there is, there is a token that uh, it doesn't matter if it's processed by any expert, it's just not processed, it's dropped, right? But this is also leaky, uh, so uh, caveat emptor as well. And yeah, you have alternative routing strategies. So I described top K routing, it's a very simple one and it works really well, but you can also do other stuff, right? So you, you can use a hash, Mapping, so basically for every token you just hash it, and this is gonna be your routing decision. And it's a very simple thing that ends up working to a cert certain extent, so it's, it's quite nice. It works surprisingly well for the simplicity, and it's super useful for inference because you know all the routing decisions beforehand. Um, you, you can also model it as a reinforcement learning problem, so you just drop differentiability altogether and just use reinforce. Uh, some people like it because it's less patchy than, than the partially differentiable loss, uh, auxiliary loss, but uh, I think I worked on it for a while and it, it's really hard to make it work. But yeah, you can see it kind of uh, as a contextual bandit, like every, every routing decision being a contact, uh, contextual bandit problem. Um, and the cool thing is that you can be a bit more uh, ambitious with the auxiliary loss, right? So you can put lots of things, oh, sorry. You can put lots of things that you want because you're just, you don't need to be differential anymore. And you have these, you can also model aspect assignment as an assignment problem, like a classic optimization problem. And then you can use the Hungarian algorithm or, the, uh, or something like the Syncord method, method to do assignments. But this is also leaky. Uh, so because you use batch level stati statistics, so you, you, yeah, you need to be a bit careful with that. But you do get more, more balanced uh, assignments. And you can go back and forth with dense models and MOEs as you're training them, right? So you can get a dense model and do this sparse upcycling, which make, turns it into an MOE. And the way you do it is basically you copy over the feed forward layers, layer E times, right? So for every expert, then you initialize the router at random, and then you keep training the model. And one cool thing is that depending on how you initialize it, you, you're gonna have the same outputs, right? Because it's just gonna, get the weighted sum of the same uh, vector. So it starts with the same out outputs, but then um, you have some small symmetry breaking things that will make it specialize a bit better with time. So it's a, it's a smooth way of making a dense model into a, an MOE model. You can also do other stuff, like you can get a really large MOE model, uh, a dense model, and make it into an MOE by clustering its parameters. And you can get an MOE model and make it into a dense model by just forcing it to use one expert all the time. And you can force it by just picking one, one expert or uh, averaging them. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm being signal here. Yeah, so I, I do have some, if you, if you guys want to take a photo of that, I do have some suggestions if you want to uh, proceed with uh, studying this.
And also, here's my contact detail. Feel free to just send me a mail. I'm, I'm going to be here for the whole day, but you can also just send me an email uh, if you're interested in MOEs or if you're interested in Mistral. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>